Hello and welcome to LRL Adventure, the show that goes places your average golf or Mondeo can't. I'm Matt and throughout this series I'll be joined by many others on this journey of four-wheeled exploration. Here on LRL we're about getting off the beaten track. There are many ways of doing that but our chosen method is using Land Rovers. And since 1948 these vehicles have been the mainstay of emergency services, military, farmers and adventurers alike. Our aim is to share our passion for four-wheeled adventure and the great outdoors. We'll also be throwing in some news, product reviews and the occasional how-tos in keeping your Land Rover on the road with workshop tips and driving advice. And we're always interested in your stories and questions, so do get involved with us on our online communities on our website, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest and even some behind the scenes on Instagram. We'll put some links on the screen for that. So let's take a look at what we've got in store for you over the next few shows. And there you have it. So coming up in today's show, I'll be taking the 2015 Range Rover Evoque Autobiography for a spin. We'll also be hearing from the inspirational couple who shunned modern living and took to travel the world for five years. But first, we should remind ourselves of how all this got started. We used to come here for our holiday periods in the bay, Red Wolf Bay and on Anglesey. I just remember my father saying, we're going to do something rather different, making a little utility vehicle, a little multi-purpose application. My father actually made a, a drawing in the sand here. He drew it for his brother to show him an idea he had for the Rover Company to produce. That must have been the sort of conception, really, of Land Rover. That was typical of your father, to say, I want to tell you, spend what I'm thinking about, it would look like this, like this, like this. Yeah. It was, you know, a very obvious thing to do. I don't suppose he had the idea that it would be so amazingly successful, but was well pleased. I remember going to the production line. They weren't all just banged out the same. It wasn't like that with Land Rover at all. There's about 10,000 different varieties of Land Rover. So we've got a kilometre image to make. We've got six Land Rovers to pull it and we've got about three hours to do it. Okay, so let's get the Harrows on and uh, off we go. I, I don't think either of them were really very PR people. They're very much sort of uh, very pragmatic and sort of uh, very much into the engineering aspects of it, the manufacture. And he didn't think of it being pretty or great advertising campaigns or anything like that. He thought, well, there's a need for it. We won't have to advertise it. They'll just come wanting it. Yeah, you're clear. You know, being able to bring decent engine power in a mobile way to where you wanted to do things was a great idea. And you know, there wasn't really anything else doing that at the time, I don't think. I think both the brothers, they both wanted a vehicle that was a sort of go-anywhere-do-anything vehicle. Something which was more utilitarian, not like a car. I think at that time, my father would have drawn in the sand his idea of something that would do that. I think David Bay said, you know, I don't want to alter this too much. It's so good as it is. It was summed up by a funny old chap on Isla meeting one for the first time said ah it is the tool for the job but whatever you're trying to do you could get help whether it's you know putting up all the trees or herding sheep or whatever using a land rover you know, it's all come on so much since then you'll just see what a primitive idea the original one was it's, but they just became part of life the cars were the cars and the land rover was the land rover there's a characteristic, isn't there? You can tell it's a Land Rover when you see it. It is an iconic design, always recognisable at a distance. So that's a great insight into where the original Land Rover came from, just a drawing in the sand. 
And joining me today on LRL Adventure, we have David and Jane, who've, uh, well, you've been on some interesting adventures. Yeah, we nipped out one morning for a, for a pint of milk in a newspaper, and five years later, six continents, 66 countries, and 134,000 miles later, we came back home. If we rewind a bit before all of that, you guys were really into adventure, or you, you really <laughs> experienced people, you no. mad land rover nuts? Absolutely not. Uh, my, my idea was it was fast cars and fast motorbikes. Never had any ideas of owning one of those slow, leaky Land Rovers. Um, but if you want to travel around the world, it's the only, only vehicle to do it in. Yeah, I sort of would say, really, we just woke up one day and thought, and let's get one of those Land Rover things and let's drive it around the world. Well, what was your life like before? Did you proper jobs and all the rest of it? Yeah, we worked the, the traditional nine to five life, worked as many hours as God would let us work, um, saved up the money, yeah. um, and that's allowed us to travel for the, for the last five years. Yeah, well, David works as a criminal lawyer and I worked in IT, which was perfect uh, credentials. It was going to help us a lot with our planned lifestyle, not. Uh, and somehow we just bought a few bits off eBay. Most of the items in the Haynes manual, spare parts is a Land Rover thing, and off we went. Hello, we're, Land Ro we're overlanders, and uh, it's been, we, we've always said if we can do it, anybody can. We are so ordinary. And coming from, from effectively administration backgrounds yes. then, I mean, is that, was, was it the tedium of that that, that pushed you over the edge to, to disappear? Uh, we yeah. spent a lot of time um, backpacking and you, it's fascinating when you can go to a country but the problem with having a, a works holiday is you can have a maximum of four weeks off and we never really felt that was enough time to explore in the countries we were on. We're always tied to local transport so what better way than, than in the Land Rover and really you know, get out to very exotic and unusual yeah. places. So I assume on that basis you must have been fairly mechanically minded before you set out. Yes, so I could put diesel in the vehicle. I knew where the water went and that was about it. After five years on the road, I probably say I'm now a qualified Land Rover mechanic. Yes. So you you bought your Defender, off you went, not a care in the world. Uh, what happened then? Well, it was literally a case we just headed south, um, all the way down through Africa to South Africa, back up then through um, Asia, India, then out to Australia, then we shipped from Australia to South America, then Central America, North America, then back home. I think another thing that really did happen, and it started to show its head, that driving a Land Rover, um, we realised there's a support network around the world for them. Uh, initially, we didn't even carry a sat-nav or we worked off maps, we don't have a phone. But then eventually people started to hear of us or about us and we were taken into people's houses. So we learnt about Land Rover and, and the, the uniqueness of us. Since you've returned, I guess nobody really knew when you, when you went away, but no. you've come back into the country with quite a bit of fanfare in November last year. Actually, it's just made that we both realise that we want more and we want to keep doing this. Um, we realise it's doable. If we can do it, anybody can. Right. So, I mean, that just sounds absolutely fantastic. It's something that uh, I, think, I think many of our viewers would wish they could, could do. Um, what is it that you get out of this this way of life and travelling and, and doing whatever it is that you do do? It's, it's an opportunity to go to down paths that are not taken by many people, to see places, uh, to experience different cultures. Uh, I know it's all cliche, but it is incredible to be able to visit places, uh, driving down dirt roads into little villages, and to go to places that they may never have seen a European before, or you know, somebody from England. I think we feel incredibly privileged to be doing this, um, and that's, it's a privilege of our own making because it's having the guts, balls and determination to actually give up everything that is familiar, but we will always feel privileged. I mean, really, that's... When you when you up sticks and leave, I guess there are sacrifices to be made and trade-offs. You know, there are various TV programs about moving to different countries and, and tears and all sorts. Um, you know, is that a difficult decision to to make that first step to to go out there and adventure? It was an easy decision to make to start with, that you then start to regret as the journey begins because you wonder whether you've made the biggest mistake in your life. There are times when you do question it, um, specifically I should say more for a woman because you've got no facilities as such. You have a box this big to put your clothes in. 
um, but they've never been that important to me anyway. But there's still times when things go wrong and everything breaks and it's rained for three days and there's mud and then the next day the sun comes out and somebody comes up to you and says oh hi guys come and stay with us or have a shower or anything and you've forgotten all that and you just remember how fabulous it is. So your vehicle is currently undergoing some uh some modifications to get you guys ready for the next leg of your trip, which is due to be in approximately May time. Mm -hmm. So if you, you're interested in what David and Jane are getting up to in the Lizzie Bus, we'll put a web address on the screen. They keep it up to date with text and video blogs and some photos along the way. And for a bit more inspiration, they'll show you loads of information about their first trip. On LRL Adventure here, we'll be keeping up to date with them as they go on their trips around the world, which incidentally, they don't plan on coming back from. And that's all for this first half. We're coming to you in part two with the Range Rover Evoke autobiography review, and we'll hear a little bit more from the Lizzie Bus. I'll see you in a few. Welcome back to LRL Adventure. Before the break, we heard from David and Jane from Lizzie Bus who've stayed with us. And now we're going to take a look at something a little bit different, jump ahead of 20 years or so, to have a look at what uh, Land Rover vehicles are doing today. Now, many of us in the adventure world probably don't get to see these very often, certainly I don't. So we decided to borrow a 2015 Range Rover Evoque autobiography and see how it's stacked up. It's smaller, lower, more car-like than anything you've seen before from Land Rover, but it does look familiar. And at £50,000 for this top spec version, it'll have to earn its stripes to attract customers and justify sporting the sacred Range Rover badge, which is boldly sported front and centre. So what do we care about the 2015 Range Rover Evoque autobiography? So we've had this vehicle for a few days now on review, and it's taken me a little bit of time to get used to it. Sure, I don't mind the way it looks, very highly specced. But I'm a daily Defender driver, so my view of a Land Rover is a little bit different to this. However, it has grown on me. This vehicle sports the green oval, so there is an expectation beyond that of what a normal car would have to do. It needs to be able to get muddy, it needs to be able to go through water, and many other things beside. One thing we do notice with all new Land Rover vehicles is that they all have taken a very aggressive styling stance. Now, the Evoque, when sat next to any of the other vehicles, does sit quite a bit lower. It's actually quite a bit shorter than the old Freelander as well. But the rest of the, the design details are very similar. I do like this, and I know that many people do, but there is a problem. If you don't like one of the Land Rovers these days, chances are you're not going to like any of them. The Range Rover, Range Rover Evoque, Range Rover Sport, and Discovery all share the same design concept be interested to see what the Defender looks like when that comes out and the Discovery Vision. So looking around the vehicle there are lots of things which to be honest I really don't know how they work it's just wizardry. You take for example the headlights. The headlights on this particular vehicle light up when you go around a corner so not only in front of you like you normally expect them to but they do turn a bit. There's also extra lights on the side which show you if you're about to run a cyclist over. Could be useful. Being an autobiography, there are a few extra things that you get. One of them is these tiny little badges on the side here that just says enough. I could spend that extra bit of money. But on the inside is really where you notice the difference. And on this particular one, it's trimmed out in cream to a very high standard with some superb stitching. We see a lot of aftermarket Defender upgrades nowadays from Khan and Bespoke and even Overfinch. And the work is always really good. But you're just reminded when you come back to a Land Rover vehicle quite how much better it can be. And this really is an exemplary example of quality inside a vehicle. That said, if you're going to get your boots muddy or your dirty trousers, you'll be valeting this quite often. It's full of all sorts of other trickery around it and some sporty touches as well. They've put a spoiler on it to, uh, I guess, give you a bit more downforce. And it's not brand new, but we kind of like it. I would quite like one of these on a Defender. You just touch this and the boot opens by itself. It does close by itself as well. Now, as we round by the boots, this isn't new, but it is worth noting with the Evoque. There isn't quite as much room in the back as you'd think. It looks quite good but just standing there looking at it but actually when you start loading kit into it you're a little bit restricted as you are in most modern cars these days by the width of the load area nonetheless it can seat five people pretty comfortably and there's a reasonable amount of leg room in the back and you could get most of your week shopping in there if not your golf clubs 
when you're buying an autobiography, you're sort of making a bit of a statement to the world. It does come with this extra little badge on there, and there are extra little bells and whistles across the vehicle. Are they necessary? Probably not. Would I like to have them? Yeah, why not? The biggest part of this vehicle was the learning curve required to actually get it going. I think I'm pretty tech savvy, but there's a lot on this, so let's take a look. First off, when you jump inside, it's not a brand new thing, but there are no gear levers. This one is a nine-speed automatic, which it has to be noted, the nine-speed gearbox is fantastic. It pulls well all the time and has a performance of what I would expect a hot hatch, really. As you can see, there are just tons of controls everywhere. And there's some I like, some I'm not so keen on. What they've done in the brand new Range Rover is added this as an option here. It's a funny looking box, but it actually gives you a heads up display and projects holographically some various bits of information on the screen whilst you're on the windscreen whilst you're going along. I don't know if I like that or not. It's, it took a little bit of getting used to, but the one thing that I can say about it is it gives you yet another place to view information. So for example, in the Evoque, there are three places if you want to know how fast you're going. You can use the traditional needle readout. In the center of the dials is also a digital readout of how fast you're going. And with the heads up display, it tells you again, projected on the windscreen. It's the same with the sat nav as well. You program the sat nav from here, but it shows up on the screen here, again in the middle of the clocks and projected up through the, through the heads up display. That's probably quite useful, but I've yet to come to a favorite of which one I prefer to look at. And whilst we're at it, the sat-nav will get you anywhere and is more reliable than Apple Maps, but I have to say if you're used to TomTom, Tom, Garmin, or any of the popular apps that you can get for smartphones these days, the actual interface on the, the map section here, it's a bit naff. There is something to be said about the complexity of vehicles these days. One of the things that you do really notice it's that you really just need an instruction manual to use it. One of the things that we did was actually, when we had this vehicle delivered, was to take it up to the dealership and just get a, an overview of all the things it can do. As with all Land Rovers these days, it comes with electric terrain response modes. These do all sorts of different things along the way, and I'm sure you've seen it on other Land Rovers as well. The one I haven't seen was dynamic. What I'd assumed that meant was you put it on dynamic and it'll just set up the car for whatever you're doing. That's not what it means. The car gets very angry, projects a whole load of red lights, stiffens the suspension and gets you ready to go racing. Most people who own an Evoque will never get its boots muddy. It'll probably be seen more often at school gates than in any grassland or mud. But you could be assured that the same effort and care has gone into the Evoque to make sure it performs off-road. And If you've been to a Land Rover Experience Centre, the Evoque will do all of the things that the Defender and the Range Rover and the Discovery will do. But this one's not ours, so we will get it bit muddy. In the spirit of hibernate, we've come out. It's absolutely freezing this morning. And uh, let's see how it goes. Getting the Evoke muddy really reminds you of its utilitarian heritage. It handled the different terrains very well and never felt panicked doing it. It's actually great fun to drive and fills you with confidence that it'll get you home no matter what. Sure, the ground clearance is not great and on this model the low profile tyres are not really designed for this kind of work. But even still, it is a real Land Rover and one that's worthy of the Range Rover mark. So that's what I thought of the 2015 Range Rover Evoque autobiography. If you agree or if you think I'm wrong, do let us know. We've got our online communities. We'll put some links on the screen on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, as mentioned, I'm a daily defender driver, and we heard from David and Jane from Lizzybus earlier, who are also d daily defender drivers. You fancy an Evoke or, or one of the new breed of off-roaders, uh, soft-roaders? Maybe if I was living at home, I would consider it, but as, as an overlanding experience, it would have to be the Defender. Yeah, uh, but uh, they look really, really impressive. And I'm sure mechanically they absolutely are. Um, so and they've got heated seats. And they've got heated seats, haven't they? <laughs> but you never know, we may have heated seats in the Lizzie Bus Lizzie too. Lizzie Bus Mark too. Depends on Mr. Tonks's uh, ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. A lot's changed really since 
since your vehicle was produced. And I mean, the vehicle that you bought, it wasn't all that long ago, but it must have been 10, 15 years old when, yeah. when you bought it. Yeah. Um, why would you go for such an old one when, you know, clearly these, these new vehicles from all manufacturers are pretty impressive? Yeah. I mean, basically, you need something that is field repairable and mechanical. Um, electronics are great um, when they work. Um, for us, we need that reliability that if any repairs are needed, that they can be done by a bush mechanic in Botswana. Yeah. And, and I guess the, the flip side of that is on the new vehicles these days, you look in, they're mainly electronically controlled, so they're probably more reliable in, in the short term, but if they do go wrong, yeah. it might be a little yeah. more difficult to fix yeah. on the road. Absolutely. If a cylinder head gasket goes on a, on a modern vehicle, it's a, it's a big job. On a 300 TDI, you can do it in four hours. Yeah, no, or I, eight hours if I do it. <laughs> and of course, the amount, the, the, the difference in costing, um, I don't think you'd be as willing to trample and stamp and have um, uh, risk getting what we call pinstripes, which is driving off-road. Mm. Obviously, they're, they're more than capable of that mm. and better. But would you want to do that to such a beautiful looking vehicle? No, I suppose if you spent £100,000 on your Range Rover, you, you don't want to uh, tin open the roof yeah. off it like you have done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Look, brilliant. Well, we wish you all the very best on your future travels and we'll be, we'll be sure to keep in touch throughout those. And as mentioned before, if you're interested in what David and Jane are doing with their Lizzie bus, do check out their website. We'll put the link on the screen for that. And that's more or less it for this show. But coming up on next week's shows, we'll be seeing more four-wheel drive adventures here on LRL Adventure.